Most people, when asked about the quality of the PowerPoint presentations that they've observed, would probably agree that most PowerPoint presentations are terrible, life-sucking wastes of time. A lot of this has to do with the fact that most people are never taught to use PowerPoint effectively. Hey, you know how to use a computer? You should have no problem making a good PowerPoint presentation. The truth is, developing effective slides to accompany a presentation takes time and effort. And a little bit of knowledge of multimedia learning theory doesn't hurt either. In this video, I'm going to be introducing the Assertion Evidence Structure, or AES, for slide design. This is a model for structuring slides developed by Michael Alley and his colleagues at Penn State University. As an overview, we'll start by examining the weaknesses of typical PowerPoint slide layouts. We'll briefly discuss the contributions that research in multimedia learning theory and cognitive psychology can provide to our quest for better slides. And finally, explain the assertion evidence structure and how to use it to increase the effectiveness of your slides. It turns out that if you've viewed any number of PowerPoint presentations, and at this point in your career, you've probably seen hundreds, it's pretty easy to identify the more effective design when given to alternatives. But it's really difficult to just start by designing that more effective slide. In truth, most people have never really thought seriously about how to design effective PowerPoint presentations. For example, over here we can see a typical topic bullet point structure slide about the relative approach to business valuation. You can probably tell that this second example where we've set off the headline from the body of the slide is a little bit more effective. We might have a little bit uh, more aesthetic appeal if we add some relevant photographs and maybe even remove the background from those photographs or uh, use highlights to draw attention to the important characteristics of our slide. Uh, but in truth, slides that contain as much text as that first example really are ineffective. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about why this is in the remainder of this presentation. Let's start, though, by examining why it is that so many PowerPoint presentation slides are so very ineffective. It starts with the fact that the defaults in PowerPoint don't do us any favors. Remember that PowerPoint was developed in 1983 and was largely seen as a vast improvement over typical overhead projectors with transparencies. But unfortunately, because we were moving from overhead projectors and transparencies to a computer-based medium, those who were using it most often didn't really think about the additional abilities that computer graphics provided. And so, for the most part, those default layouts that we see with a topic bullet point design in PowerPoint are the same types of things that people were doing with an overhead projector and a transparency. This topic subtopic structure that's guided by the default slide layouts in PowerPoint is pervasive across presentation contexts. For example, one study in 2009 published in the journal Technical Communication showed that 59% of industry and government presentations used this topic-subtopic structure. 63% of professional conferences and 71% of student presentation slides in their content analysis used this default topic-subtopic or topic bullet point structure. Well, there are a few problems with this. First, even if you have a professional theme and relevant images on your slide, there's still way too much text in a typical default slide layout. There are a few reasons why this large amount of text is a problem. First, Harvard Business Review in 1998 published an article arguing that bullet lists, as are typically used in these topic subtopic structure slides, dilute thought. Essentially, they make us stupider and they make our presentation stupider because topics and bullet points can only communicate three logical relationships. 
we can talk about sequence. First this happened, then this happened, then this other thing happened. Or we can talk about priority. These are our most important goals for the quarter. Or we can talk about membership. Here is a general topic, and here are a bunch of facts that are sort of related to this general topic. But the truth is, in our presentations, often we're talking about information that has relationships that are far more complex than simply sequence, priority, or membership. But using the default layouts in PowerPoint doesn't afford us the ability to explain these complex relationships to our audience. But beyond simply diluting our thought and hindering us from explaining complex relationships between ideas to our audience, presenters often, when faced with lots of text on the screen, are obligated to read that to the audience. We have a need to read text when we see it, and our audience has a need to read that text as well. So presenters often mirror the information on their slide with their oral presentation. Unfortunately, cognitive psychology tells us that simultaneous speech and text are processed by the same part of the brain, which ultimately splits attention. Now, it might seem to make intuitive sense. If you hear information, you might remember it. And if you see information, you might remember it. So if you both hear and see information, you ought to remember it the best. But it turns out that research has shown this to be entirely incorrect. Researchers in cognitive psychology, human learning, and multimedia design have found that presenting information through both channels simultaneously overwhelms the language processor and actually results in lower information retention. In research published in the academic journal Applied Cognitive Psychology, Slava Kalyuga and colleagues conducted an experiment in which they varied the presentation medium of training materials designed to teach apprentices about types of solder and how to correctly solder various types of joints. Some participants received written instructions only, some received written instructions and also were read those instructions orally, and some received instructions only orally. Well, it turns out, and you can see from the graph over here, that overall, the lowest performing condition was that simultaneous text and speech condition. It simply was overwhelming the language processing part of the brain to have both the information presented as written text and as spoken language. And unfortunately, most of our PowerPoint presentations are right in this part of the graph, simultaneous text and speech. In reality, this research suggests that where we really want to be is to have most of our presentation delivered orally through spoken speech. And this tracks well with what we know about models of human working memory. Bedelli's model of working memory suggests that when we receive information through our senses, our central executive sends it to one of two places, either the visuospatial sketch pad, which processes images and visual information, or to the phonological loop, which processes language. We know that linguistic information, whether it's presented in a text-based form that a person can read, or in spoken form, both types of information are processed by the phonological loop. This model of working memory would suggest that we are overloading the phonological loop when we are simultaneously presenting both written and spoken information. So what can be done about this? If we know that the typical topic-subtopic structure provides too much text for the audience, overwhelms the phonological loop, what can we do instead? Well, one alternative is called the assertion evidence structure. And this was developed by Michael Alley and his colleagues at Penn State University. And it calls for a complete rethinking of the way that slides should be designed. Rather than starting with a topic-based headline, he suggests starting with a full sentence assertion. So actually tell the audience 
what the most important information on your slide is. Here we can see a typical topic bullet point slide about the history of the iPhone. If we were to convert that to an assertion evidence structure slide, we might instead see something like this, getting rid of the history of the iPhone topic-based headline and in replacing it with a full sentence assertion. The iPhone has received four major updates since its introduction in June 2007. Then, rather than simply listing the model numbers and the dates that they were released, we might visually orient the audience using a timeline that would provide them not only with the dates that each model was released, but also with an image of each model so we can see the progression of the model over time. And using a timeline, we can also see additional information like the approximate duration of time between model releases and the approximate time of year that new models come out. All of this provides the audience with a much richer understanding of the relationship between the pieces of information on the slide. And that's one of the key strengths of the assertion evidence structure. But beyond simply allowing you to provide your audience with a more complex understanding of the relationship between the information points on your slide, the assertion evidence structure also provides much better retention for the audience. One study was conducted, published in the journal Technical Communication in 2006, that showed that simply replacing non-full sentence assertion headlines with full sentence assertion headlines drastically improved the recall of students who were then tested on this information later. You can see here that this example of a slide used in a college level geology class more than doubled student recall simply by turning that headline into a full sentence assertion headline. Similarly, this one about color in diamonds, by changing that headline from a question about what causes color in diamonds and instead explaining in the headline itself the things that cause color in diamonds, again, resulted in a doubling of performance when later tested about that information. So the assertion evidence structure gives us the ability to represent more complex relationships between ideas. It focuses the audience on the most important information that they should take out of each section of the presentation. And finally, it results in much better retention of your audience for the information that you're presenting. So now the question is, how do you implement the assertion evidence structure in your own slides? There are three primary characteristics of the assertion evidence structure. It starts with the guideline that all blocks of text on your slide should be no more than two lines high. Now this guidance forces you to really think carefully about what text is important to include on your slide. So beyond your two line assertion headline, if you have any other text on the slide, whether that's a call out or a label of various parts of a diagram or any other text on the slide, all blocks should be no more than two lines. That reduces the amount of time that your audience spends reading your slide and not listening to what you're saying. The second key characteristic of an assertion evidence structure slide is that the slide body should provide visual evidence that clearly supports the assertion. And finally, if you use animation in an assertion evidence slide, it should be purposeful. So it should actually help the audience better understand the information on the slide. So for example, here's a slide that was developed by one of my students that I think is an exemplary assertion evidence structure slide. We have a two line assertion headline that claims that construction of the Autobahn highway system accelerated with the expansion of Nazi Germany. On the left, we have a graph that shows the number of miles completed on the Autobahn by year. And on the right, we have a map that shows German controlled territories in Europe. So as we step through, we have very purposeful animation so that we can see 
as the Autobahn gets longer and longer, we have an increasingly powerful Germany in terms of the amount of area in Europe that they control. So we have visual evidence that is supporting a key assertion. So when you think about the assertion evidence structure, think about no more than two lines in a headline that makes an assertion, makes a claim, and then visual evidence that supports the claim made in the headline. One thing that you'll find when you first start using the assertion evidence structure is that it takes a little bit more time to carefully develop your assertion headlines. So for example, a typical topic, subtopic slide might have a headline like the importance of bread. Well, this is pretty weak because we don't have any idea what the slide is about. Why is bread important? Bread is important for what? We get a little bit closer with a question. Why is bread critical to peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Now we have some idea of where this presentation is going but we still don't know the answer to the question and you shouldn't force your audience to scour the rest of your slide trying to find an answer to the question. It's better and will result in better audience retention if you instead include the full assertion in your headline. Something like this. Bread serves as the handle for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Now your audience knows exactly where you're going and what you're trying to prove to them through the use of this slide. One thing that you'll find when you start developing these assertion headlines is that it takes extra time to come up with clear and concise declarative assertion headlines. So for example, this presentation that you're watching right now this particular headline went through four revisions before I felt that it was clear, concise, and communicated the information that I wanted to communicate. After you've developed your clear, concise assertion headline, it's next your job to find visual evidence that will support your assertion. So for example, here we have a great visual that shows how bread is the handle for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We're not simply being told that it's critical to a PB&J. We're shown through this visual evidence how peanut butter and jelly sandwich simply wouldn't work without the bread. Effective assertion evidence structure slides have succinct headlines and clearly relevant visual evidence. And that is the key, clearly relevant visual evidence. So here we have a clear and concise headline followed by visual evidence that unquestionably supports the assertion made in the headline. Here's another one. A supply chain moves goods from the supplier to the customer. And we can see the various stages in the supply chain on this chart that was produced by the student who developed this slide. Here's one that makes good use of visualized numeric information. So identity theft is the most common consumer complaint to the Federal Trade Commission. We can see a list of complaints that are made to the Federal Trade Commission and without a doubt identity theft is the number one in terms of number of complaints made to the FTC. Here's one that makes really good use of animation and we can see this explanation of how the MRI process creates a three-dimensional image by taking successive slices of the brain and layering them together. One thing to be careful of as you start to use the assertion evidence structure is that your visual evidence actually supports your assertion. Here's an example of one. Modular buildings provide an inexpensive alternative with low overhead. And our visual evidence in this case is a photograph of a modular building. But unfortunately, although this graphic is related to our assertion, it does not in any way support the assertion that's being made. There are two key ideas in this assertion. First, modular buildings provide an inexpensive alternative and second, modular buildings have lower overhead compared ostensibly to conventional construction. But that's not what this visual evidence supports. 
a better version of this slide might instead include a chart or a graph showing how modular buildings are less expensive compared to traditional construction. Maybe a second slide would provide a chart showing how uh, modular buildings have lower maintenance and utility costs compared to traditional construction, talking about overhead. So make sure that the body visual evidence actually supports the assertion. Here's another great example of one that's not really an assertion evidence structure slide. This slide makes the case that of all the people who are targeted for tax return fraud, the most vulnerable are the deceased, the elderly, and children. But rather than showing us visually how the deceased, elderly, and children are attacked more often in terms of tax return fraud, this simply presents an image of a target, one of the words from the assertion. This is not visual evidence that clearly supports the assertion being made. So what you'll find as you start to implement the assertion evidence structure in your own slides is that sometimes you need to make your own visual evidence, particularly with topics where there isn't visual evidence available. For numeric information, you can do this through charts and graphs, and you might have to get creative at times to produce visual evidence that clearly supports your assertion headline. Hopefully, you now have a good understanding of the weaknesses of the typical topic subtopic structure in PowerPoint. You should have an understanding of what we can learn from research in cognitive psychology and multimedia learning to help us improve our slides. And finally, you should have a good handle on the assertion evidence structure and be able to begin applying it in your own presentations.